Thank you very much and good morning ladies and gentlemen. As you probably heard, I do speak with a different dialect. So please bear with me. If you don't, if I speak very fast and you can't hear me, just put up your hand and I'll understand. I'll try and speak a little bit clearer. But the vocabulary isn't exactly the same as what you're accustomed to here in America. Uh, very interesting uh, and humorous situation a couple of days ago. We were traveling up here and we stopped at a, at a filling station, a gas station as you'd call it. And I went into the, inside into the uh, cafe there to order some coffee. And there was a young lady there, very helpful and very friendly. And I ordered some coffee and we started talking. And I went to pay and she said to me, what language do you speak? French. So I said, no, I'm actually speaking English at the moment. <laughs> uh, I do speak another two languages, but neither of them is French. So if we have difficult understanding me, maybe we need a French interpreter. But I hope that won't be necessary. What I'd like to, I have a background, as Gabe said, in terms of uh, using cattle to improve land and to grow a lot, a lot of grass. I did that in 1995. I doubled my stocking rate overnight virtually because of better grass utilization. Our environment is very different to what you have here. We have a four month intense rainy season where we get 40 inches of rain over a four month period. And then we have eight months of dry. So what we require in an environment like that is extremely high stock densities. Uh, for two reasons basically. One is to utilize the grass and impact the land. And the other reason is that with high densities you have to move the cattle frequently. And that helps in terms of the body condition. I also realized at a very early stage, my background is animal science and cattle breeding. I realized at a very early stage that we also had to change the genotype of our cattle. Because our cattle aren't being bred for grass conversion efficiency. Our cattle are being bred. We are trying to change an efficient ruminant into an inefficient hog. And that is a problem that we have. So we have to try and rewind history by 60 or 70 years to find the right genetics. But fortunately, we still have unimproved breeds of cattle and unimproved cattle we can use to improve our so-called improved breeds. So that's basically what I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to talk much about the, uh, the grazing side. I'm sure everyone's familiar with that. I'm going to talk about how we can, what sort of genotype we require, and how we can quickly change our cattle into a genotype that is efficient at grass conversion. Just as a bit of a background, a lot of people uh, often ask me, why do you still live in Africa, in particular in Zimbabwe? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is that that's a view from our home. So we live in a very a beautiful part of the world, a very pleasant climate, uh, reasonably cool, warm winters, much warmer than here, and very pleasant summers. We also have uh, beautiful scenery. This is a man-made lake not far from us, and that's the sunset of that lake. So when life gets very difficult and the politicians are a problem, we take a vacation on the lake. I lost my land in 2002. I had to move around and then I eventually ended up buying a very small property uh, because we're not allowed to own land in our country of birth. And on the front lawn uh, where my wife has a lawn and flowers, I was able to graze some cattle. So that made me feel a lot happier. Okay, the biggest paradigm shift required by a cattleman is we have to change our goal, our objective from production per animal to sustainable profit per acre. I would like to emphasize that because that is extremely important. Production per animal would be the equivalent of a corn farmer measuring his production, not in bushels per acre or tons per hectare, but in individual plants that are probably spaced 12 feet apart and measuring the cob size with the amount of grain each plant produces. 
Now that's exactly what we're doing with conventional cattle breeding. Because 99.9% .9 of cattle breeders, their production goal is production per animal or profit per animal. And that is negatively correlated to profit per hectare or profit per acre. And if we're in a business of cattle farming, cattle ranching, from a business point of view, we have to maximize profit per acre and we have to maximize our uh, interest on our capital that we invested in our land. And I'm sure the land prices here are very high relative to the amount of cattle you can carry. I do work in South Africa. I don't live in South Africa. It's a different country. I do work there. And South Africa is probably one of the most expensive countries to uh, ranch cattle because of the high land price is relative to the very low conventional stocking rate. So that is a problem we have. So what I'm going to talk about is production per animal, how we can maximize uh, production per, animal, uh, per hectare rather, on a sustainable, ecologically and economically sustainable basis. So stocking rate, if we understand that, if our goal is maximum profit per acre, it reinforces two very important truths. One is that stocking rate is by far the most important determinant of profit. And it's, it's a really easy matter to increase our stocking rates through appropriate grazing management. Can everyone hear me at the back there? I didn't ask. Can you all hear me? Thank you. So it is important that we understand that stocking rate is by far the most important determinant of profit. And even with a low production per animal, which uh, invariably is the case, when you do increase your stocking rate and you're forcing cattle to graze less selectively, production per animal will drop. But apart from that, despite that, you will still increase your profit per acre and you'll be able to improve the land. The other very important truth is that inherent body condition is a genetic foundation for economic and ecological sustainability. Body condition, everything in cattle breeding and management revolves around body condition. Just take a minute to think about that. Everything in cattle breeding and management revolves around body condition. If we don't have inherent body condition in our cattle, we have to feed them to achieve the required body condition. So we do have a choice. We can breed for inherent body condition. We can ma manage for good body condition in terms of our grazing management. Or we can feed for good body condition. So if our, if our goal is maximum profit per acre, then obviously inherent good body condition is a, an attribute that we would like. So the current revolution in grazing management, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with, Alan Savory started many years ago, and it seems to be that a lot of people have caught on to that and using his uh, ideas to improve uh, grass management. The current revolution in grazing management needs to be complemented by a cattle breeding revolution. And we have to do that very quickly. If we see the type of cattle we have, they are definitely not suited, the majority of them are not suited for grass conversion efficiency. So an increase in stocking rate must be reflected by a proportional increase in profit per acre. And the only way we can do that is by breeding cattle that are efficient grass converters, which will be reflected in high inherent body condition. So I'll, every now and again, I have a, I'll have a blank slide on the, on the screen. So anyone's welcome to ask questions while that uh, slide is on the screen. Otherwise, I'll just carry on. So I'd just like to reiterate again is that an increase that to grow a lot of grass is a relatively easy matter. The urgent need is now to breed cattle that can convert that grass efficiently into beef. We have to understand that cattle have a dual role. One is to improve the land and efficient grass conversion. Improving the land is relatively easy. If you see what we've done there, that impact you see on the left-hand side of the screen there uh, is what was necessary under those circumstances. You can see the grass is very short, uh, pale color, and the result is 10, 10 months later on the right-hand side. So with the type of management that we can implement, the results can be extremely dramatic. 
There again, this is the drier part of South Africa. The only difference between the left-hand photograph and the right-hand photograph is the fence line. That's the only difference. And of course, on the right-hand side, you have better management, higher stock density, and higher stocking rate because of that. So growing more grass is relatively easy. Efficient utilization of herbage is the greater challenge. If you've got that amount of grass, and that isn't my small piece of land that I do have, the grass is 12 foot tall and probably higher, it's a challenge to be able to utilize that grazing efficiently. There are a couple of things we require for efficient grass utilization. One is a high stock density, and that's extremely important. I'm sure most of you understand that. I had a case uh, very, uh, it was a good example for me. I talk about, in certain environments, and I'm talking about my environment, is that your stock density can be too high, but not high enough for efficient grass utilization. And by what I mean by that is that you can have a stock density that's relatively high, the animals move around in an area, they pollute the area, they dung and they urinate and they kick up dust, and a lot of the grass becomes fouled and they can't graze that. What is then required is to go even much higher in terms of stock density, where the animals are confined to a very small piece of land where they don't walk around much, and in a short period of time they're able to utilize that. And that, the results have been very dramatic in certain environments. And the environment that I come from, you can have a stock density that's high, but not high enough. But a lot of the environments, particularly in the United States here, we have different type of grazing. You have, generally speaking, high octane grasses, what I refer to as high octane. We have very low octane grazing. And the problem with the low octane grazing is that the nutrient content per mouthful of uh, eaten by the cattle is very low. So they have to eat a lot of grass. And much of that grass is very high in fiber. So there's a challenge we have. So we have to go to extremely high stock densities and frequent moves with an appropriate recovery period. In, in a high rainfall environment where the grass matures very quickly, the recovery period can be too long in terms of grass quality. In low rainfall environments like most, much of the Western United States, you have to go to extremely long recovery periods. And, the, pro and the, the, the benefit there is that you have a lot of grass, but the quality is still high relative to higher rainfall environments. So one has to manage that in terms of your environment. We also have to manage, uh, with frequent moves, we'll have healthy human microbes to a large degree. We don't change the quality over a long time, but over a very short period of time. And the other important factor is that in certain environments, we have to uh, give supplemental feeding. And by supplemental feeding, I mean very low uh, amounts of protein, for instance, in a tropical environment that allows the human microbes to increase and thereby they can digest the grass. One of our big problems is the low protein in the grass and we require to feed the microbes, not the animal. The, the, by feeding the microbes, have a healthy human microbe, then grass digestion is much more efficient and by doing that, the animals can take up to 3% more grass, which allows them to have an excess or a larger amount of energy and protein available for production. But what I'm going to talk about is the genetic, genetically efficient grass converters. That is what we require. So efficient herbage utilization and maximum profit per hectare require, in most circumstances, non-selective grazing. If you're not utilizing all your grass, your, max, your profit per acre won't be maximized. So non-selective grazing, as far as I'm concerned, is essential. For that reason, the other reason that I feel non-selective grazing is essential is that if you do graze selectively, as I did at one stage, you will have a change in grass species composition. And you'll have your poorer grasses, less palatable grasses increasing. In a certain environment, that can happen over a very short period of time. In my environment, it happened within two years. So I had to change my whole grazing uh, timing and density to cater for that. What you see on the right-hand side there, which is totally unusual for cattle, is how they've utilized bushes and trees. 
and that is because of the timing. Uh, all bushes and trees have a defense mechanism in the form of tannin, which uh, allows the grasses to become less palatable and even po poisonous, not the grasses, I mean the trees. Now, if your timing is correct, if over a very short period of time in the area, and the recovery time is long enough, the tannin content stays, stays very low. So what cattle have done there is normally done by large animals like uh, rhino and elephant in Africa. So we're doing the equivalent of that by using cattle. So do, if you do have a problem with bush encroachment, as we do have there, then we can uh, address that by using cattle at very high stock density. Okay, the, the problem now is although cattle have to graze non-selectively, the problem with conventionally bred cattle is that they need to graze selectively in order to be productive. And I'd, I hope you understand what I mean by that. Uh, because of the higher nutrient requirement of the cattle the way they've been bred, the only way we can maximize production per animal is by allowing them to select, selectively graze. And that is a problem. By doing that, you are changing your grass species composition to a poorer type of grass. So we have to change the genotype of the cattle to allow us to use those cattle to improve the land and maximize profit per acre. I'm happy you did ask a question because uh, I was in one um, meeting many years ago, probably about the same amount of people as in this room here, and there was a professor who spoke before me and he gave his talk and uh, after the talk there was question time and nobody put up their hands for questioning and they waited another two minutes, no questions and eventually some um, joker stood up at the back of the audience and said, when is it going to rain? <laughs> so, <laughs> I, hope, I hope I'm giving you more information than that. The genetic foundation, and that's, I'm starting to answer your question that that gentleman asked me now. The genetic foundation of efficient grass conversion is inherent body condition and a high, is a high relative intake. And I'd like to explain that. The larger an animal is, obviously the more an animal uh, eats, grazes grass, the intake is much higher. But the relationship between intake and grass intake Grass intake, rather than size, is not in proportion. So the larger an animal is, the less the relative intake is. Although it grazes more grass, relative to its size, it ingests far less grass. The smaller animal, smaller frame animal, has the unfair advantage of being able to eat more relative to its size. If you think of all the mammals in the world, and that's a biological fact, if you look at mice on the one side and you look at elephant on the other side, which animal has got the highest intake? Obviously the elephant. Which animal has got the highest relative intake? The mouse. And that's related again to production. So same with cattle. Within a, within a herd of cattle, within a breed of cattle, you'll have that variation. And your smaller frame animal has an unfair advantage. And your large frame animal is actually genetically handicapped because it's a fact that relative to their size, they cannot eat more in relation to the size relative to a small animal. So what, what does that mean? The animal with a higher relative intake will have better body condition. And body condition is everything. So ge the genetic determinants of a higher relative intake or inherent body condition are one frame size, two, climatic adaptation, parasite disease resistance, and individual appetite. Okay, climatic adaptation, everyone understands. If an animal is under heat stress, the intake will be less. So we need cattle that can handle heat. And I realize that your environment here in the United States, you have extremes in terms of most parts of the country in terms of winter cold and summer heat. And that is a challenge for you. The Midwest around here and further south, you have the problem of heat stressed cattle. And when I traveled through the United States uh, last year, I went through 11 states, and I've never seen so many heat stressed cattle in my life as I saw there. And I come from a tropical environment. 
So in our environment, the cattle can handle heat because they're climatically adapted. So what you have to do is you have to genetically modify your cattle. And I think the emphasis will be in the southern states, will definitely be, and even in the Midwest, will be to try and get better heat adaptation in. It's no point in having a cold adaptation and you have cattle that have to put on body condition in the summer and they can't put on enough body condition because they haven't sleeked off and they have a problem with heat. Because like any animal, like any person, if you have a temperature, you stop eating. And it's exactly the same with cattle. If, they, if the, the temperature is raised because of heat stress, they will slow down, stop eating. So the intake will be less. So there is a required intake for all animals per day, your maintenance requirement. So the higher the intake is above maintenance requirement, the more efficient that animal is going to be. So intake is extremely important, and particularly relative intake. Climatic adaptation is one. Parasite disease resistance is exactly the same. You have a lot of problems with your, I see with uh, biting flies. In Africa, we have a problem with biting flies, ticks, internal parasites, and we have cattle that are adapted to that. They've survived for centuries under those conditions. So what we have in those cattle today are the survivors of those conditions. So genetically, we have cattle that can handle those stresses. And then appetite is extremely important. They did some research in New Zealand many years ago, 1950s, where they took uh, identical twins and they compared them in terms of intake. The difference between the grass intake of identical pair of twins was something like 1%. But between groups of twins, it went up to 40% in difference in grass intake, which is a massive difference. And then they did a study to see why there was such a difference. And they saw that some animals graze for a far longer period than the eight hours. That's conventionally uh, assessed as being the grazing time. They graze for a longer period and they graze more vigorously, more aggressively. So they had a higher intake. And that's genetic. So we can select for that. The other one I haven't mentioned, which is extremely important, is frame size. Our cattle today, 99% of our cattle are probably too large in terms of frame size. So every environment has a limit in terms of frame size. In a tropical environment with low octane grazing, the cattle have to be extremely small frame. Where I come from, and I'm talking about kilograms now to explain to you, or pounds, to explain frame size, we have cows that weigh 700 pounds. So they're very small, but they have a very large relative intake. And that's because of that low quality grazing. In a high octane environment, like the west of the United States, you can still, uh, cattle with larger frames can still be productive. But the most productive animals in the inner environment will be smaller frame. Now we have a bit of a challenge here. Do we select for smaller cattle or do we select for more efficient grass converting cattle? So I don't suggest we select for smaller cattle. I suggest we select for more efficient grass converting cattle. But our cattle are too big. So the quicker we realize that and the quicker we change the frame, the better it will be for us. The relationship between frame size and efficiency of grass conversion I'd like to speak a little bit about. And there's some extremely important points that I haven't had time to explain to you, to you the background, but there are three extremely important uh, conclusions in terms of growth rate, which is related to frame size and efficiency of grass conversion. If you look at animals at different frame sizes and at different growth rates, there are three very important conclusions. One is that the faster an individual animal gains weight, the greater the efficiency. And I will emphasize individual animal. The faster an individual animal gains weight, the greater the efficiency. Does that mean that the fastest gaining animal is most efficient? And I'm asking a question. Does that mean that in your herd, or any herd, the fastest growing animal is most efficient? Yes or no? No. So you understand there's a difference. There's a size that has to be taken into consideration. So individual gain is extremely important. So in individual animal, we have to manage in terms of intake. And that will result in a faster gain. Each animal, each individual, 
has a maintenance requirement, which is essential. And that maintenance requirement remains the same whether that animal is not gaining any weight or is gaining two pounds or three pounds a day. The maintenance requirement is exactly the same. So the more energy, more nutrients an animal can ingest above maintenance requirement, the more efficient that growth is going to be. So if an animal is only gaining a quarter of a pound a day, as opposed to that same animal gaining one pound or two pounds a day, there's a vast difference in terms of grass conversion efficiency. A big difference. So we have to manage for where we can for fast growth. So in terms of our grazing management, that's essential to take it into consideration. We require fast individual growth, and that comes from intake. And there are many factors that will influence that intake that we have control over. Okay, so the faster individual gains weight, the greater the efficiency. But that does not mean that the fastest gaining animal is the most efficient. At similar weight gains, the smaller individual is more efficient. Okay, the, the thing is that in any herd, you have a variation in size. I think most of you will agree with me. A very big variation. You'd be surprised to see what that variation is. It's probably 30% and more in terms of your smallest frame animal and your largest frame animal. Okay, if, what that means then is that your smaller frame animal at the same growth rate is far more efficient. So the challenge we have now is how do we identify the, f the more efficient grass converters because we can't use absolute gain. We can't use daily gain. We can't use weaning weight. We can't use yearling weight. We can't use 18 month weight. We can't use mature weight. Because all those weights are positively correlated to mature size, which again is negatively correlated to grass conversion efficiency. So we have to somehow devise a, a selection criteria that allows us to select the most efficient gaining animal. Okay, in order to gain at equal efficiency, animals of varying size, as found in a herd, have to gain in proportion to their size. Now I said that there's at least a 30% difference in any herd between your, in terms of frame size between your cows. What that means is that your small frame cow relative to your large frame cow. That large frame cow, her progeny, at any time, any given date, or any given time, has to weigh 30% more than the small frame animal. Now let's think about bull selection. How many bull breeders take that into consideration? We only select for size, we select for growth rate, we select for weaning weight, yearling weight. Now by doing that, we are, we are selecting an animal that does grow faster but it doesn't go fast in proportion to its size. Why? Why can't a larger animal, why does a larger animal have a difficulty in growing in proportion to its size? Because they can't eat in proportion to its size. So although that, that is a, a biological requirement, they have to grow in proportion to their size to be equally efficient, they can't eat in proportion to their size. The difference between, I'm going to give two extreme cases, I'm going to, and I'm going to translate it into pounds for you so you understand. The difference between a 700 pound cow, which you don't, probably don't have here, and a 1400 pound cow, is that the relative intake of a 700 pound cow, everything else being equal, is going to be 20% more than that of a 1400 pound cow. A 20% higher relative intake translates to 20% higher uh, body condition. And that probably translates to about a 10% higher uh, fertility conception rate. Therefore, small frame animals have an unfair advantage and large frame animals are genetically handicapped. This, if I could make it easy for you to understand, the smaller, and just think about this, the smaller and heavier, the better, the more efficient. So what it means is that all animals have a come with a certain package. It's like comparing sugar. You get sugar in different size packages. You have a five, a five pound package of sugar and you have a 10 pound package of sugar. Now imagine a 
10 pound package of sugar with nine pounds of sugar in it. Nine pounds is much more than eight. But imagine that eight pounds of sugar in a five pound package. What will that animal look like relative to the eight and five package relative to the nine and 10 package? That's the easiest way to understand it. So if you ever have to go and select bulls and you don't have the relevant, appropriate uh, figures, which 99.9% .9 of the case wouldn't be there. You wouldn't have those figures. Disregard all those figures. Disregard all performance figures. Disregard EPDs. Stay away from them. Just look at the animal. If you had to select a bull for yourself, in a contemporary group, look at the bull that's got the fullest package. And that's the bull that's the most efficient grass converter. He's got the best body condition. And that body condition will translate also into higher practical fertility. I talk about practical fertility and academic fertility. The two determinants of fertility. One is hormonal balance, and the other is body condition. Practically speaking, body condition overrides hormones. So an animal can have a high, good hormonal balance, but if a cow doesn't have good body condition, it's academic. She won't reconceive. So body condition is extremely important. Okay, so I'm going to take another break. I see some people have had a heavy night last night. So are there any questions? Yes, sir. Do you graze sheep? The question is, do I graze sheep? No, I don't. The principles will be exactly the same, I believe. I don't have much experience with sheep because our environment is very difficult for sheep to survive. Exact, exactly. That's why sheep are more efficient than cattle. 100 percent. At least twice as efficient in terms of feed conversion. It's again that relative intake is very high. And even with sheep, we have to select for that. If we select for growth, we select for uh, weight per day of age, we're going to select larger sheep and not more efficient sheep. So we have to devise a selection criteria that can identify the most efficient grass converters. And I'll come to that later. Any other questions? Yes. Before you were talking about recovery rate for the ground uh, in your grass, so how do you determine if you're going to have a longer recovery rate or a shorter recovery rate? Well, I'll just give you two examples. In my environment, um, we have 40 inches in the four-month period with high humidity, high temperatures. So over a short period of time, you have a massive growth of grass after it's been grazed. Now, what happens in that tropical environment is the, the grass is extremely high in fiber. So as the grass matures, it becomes fibrous and it becomes, much, uh, it becomes more difficult for the animal to convert that grass because of the fact that it can't ingest enough. So the octane rating goes down. It's like fuel with a low and high octane rating. So in that environment, my animals have to probably take two or three mouthfuls of grass to get the same nutrients as an environment similar to here or the Western United States. With one mouthful of grass, they get enough nutrients. So what I have to do there, I have to plan that they, re they go back and re regraze before the grass is recovered completely. Okay, so in a certain sense, you might be overgrazing technically. But if you're doing it non-selectively, it's not a problem. Particularly if those areas alternate between years, which you graze intensively and in the summer, and you allow, like our environment, we have an eight-month dry period, so we need a, a drought reserve. So large por portions of the property are reserved each year for the dry season. So I had the option of doing that, and I did that. I concentrated on a small area, quick recovery, before the grass is totally recovered, maybe 80% recovery in terms of energy reserves in the roots. Do it non-selectively. You won't get a ch change in species composition, and you alternate between years. So if you do have that situation, I'm not sure whether it is a case here. There might be cases in other parts of the southeast, maybe. But if you do have that situation, one has to plan for a quicker recovery. The worst you can do in an environment like that is to have a long recovery period, and cattle come into very mature, high fiber grazing, and they can't utilize it. I don't know whether that answers your question. Yes, sir. Yeah. 
the question is, uh, uh, should we, I think the question is, should we be using statistics, figures, or just visual? At the moment, with the figures we have, I would say just a visual assessment. But I do have figures that are extremely effective in doing it, in uh, identifying those animals, which I'll explain later. But apart from that, the best you can do is just to visually assess an animal. Okay, how can anyone in the right mind try to genetically change efficient grass converting ruminants into in inefficient grain converting hogs? And that's exactly what we're doing. We're trying to do. It's the same as going to a hog farmer or a chicken farmer and telling them they must select the chickens for efficient grass conversion. That's what we're doing. It's incredible that the human mind can be so can have such paradigms. And we're talking about learned peop learned people making those conclusions. Um, so by breeding inefficient hogs, cattle breeders have forfeited inherent body condition in favor of feed out of the bag and selective grazing. And that is a problem. So we have to, okay, here. Yeah. What am I? Am I an efficient ruminant and an inefficient hog? So what am I? And that's what a lot of people pride themselves with breeding animals like that. Now I can guarantee you that an animal with that size in my environment, if I put it on the grass, it wouldn't take them very long to die. The human mind is an enigma. That is what we've done. These have been the ideal types from dwarfs in the 1950s to these fertile oxen that we saw from the 1970s. And unfortunately, that fertile oxen syndrome is still very much evident. So what happened is because they were, they were selecting for smaller cattle in the 1950s for some other reason, showing, selecting for smaller cattle, I think it probably became like a hobby. And they eventually ran into dwarfism. They, the cattle, stud breeders, seed stock breeders, got such a fright that they started using hip height measurements to select for larger cattle. Now, if you're familiar with the influence of hormones on size, you'll realize what happened there, why that is a fertile ox. Because for selecting for frame size, hip height, you're indirectly selecting for later sexual maturity. And that's exactly what happened there. Because early sexual maturity, testosterone in the bull, estrogen in the cow limits frame size. So we become clever, we select for frame size. Uh, it's like taking in poison, frame size. We're willingly taking poison. And now we have a problem because we've taken poison, small testers. So what do we do now? As an antidote, we start selecting for scrotal, scrotal circumference. But the two go, don't go together, totally antagonistic. Frame size and scrotal circumference are antagonistic. But that's just uh, to show you how how far we've gone wrong and still off the track in terms of cattle breeding. So the truth does not become a lie because no one believes it. Neither does a lie become the truth because everyone believes it. The unfortunate thing is, is that there's a lot of superstition around. A lot of truths have become myths. And a lot of lies have been believed. The more people that believe a lie, the more truthful that lie becomes. If we did everything opposite of convention, we would be much more right than wrong. Just think about that. <laughs> that says a lot for our, the human mind. And I, I've often said that, and I believe now there's more truth and humor in that statement. If we did exactly the opposite of what everyone else is doing, we can close our eyes and we'd probably be right. And that, it, it reminds me of a quote from Albert Einstein when they developed the atomic bomb in 1945, I think it was. Uh, he said the, the problem with mankind is perfection of means, EPDs, and confusion of goals. What do we do with them? We've got the atomic bomb, we've got EPDs, what do we do with that? How can we use EPDs to improve our cattle? I'll come to that a little bit later. Okay, we concern ourselves with detail and lose sight of the bigger picture. EPDs and genomes. Okay, if we have these EPDs, how do we use them in, in uh, 
selecting more efficient cattle. What is too big? What's too small? What's too slow? What's too fast? What's too little? What's too much? It's impossible for us to decide. So this is the problem we have when we look at nature in detail. It becomes extremely complex. We will never understand it. And the more we go into detail, the greater our problems are going to be. So we have an option to complicate matters or simplify matters. Any questions? We don't need a French interpreter yet. Do you understand? <laughs> yes, do we? Do you understand or do you need an interpreter? Okay, thank you. Yes. Do you see any place to use pro There's a place for all measurements, uh, Kim, as long as we do it appropriately. I do see that, particularly if you have a lot of bulls, young bulls at a yearning age, 12 months. Scrotal circumference, I think, is a very good indication of early sexual maturity, yes. But you also have to understand that the, nature does allow a lot of variation in terms of scrotal size. So uh, we can select, I saw a bull, I'm, I'm getting a, I saw a bull in Mexico. Um, I'm trying to describe the size of his testes. Uh, we play rugby in Africa. I think you, we have a, you have a similar ball that you play football with. They're probably about that size. I mean, we don't need cattle with testes that size. So obviously they, they can be too small or too large. So there's variation involved. How I'd like to do it is I would like to, uh, measure testers at 12, at 12 months, because that's a relatively early age. And I will also compare relative to the animal's mature size at 12 months of age. So we set testers size relative to the animal's uh, mature size. So if we do that, I think it's a very good tool to, for, to, for selecting for early sexual maturity. In bulls, which will reflect in heifers as well. So there is definitely a role for it, yes. But it, there's no point in selecting for testa size, you're also selecting for hip height. You know, it's, it's two contradictory things. And that's what happened. Okay, body condition is everything. All management and breeding decisions affect body condition. And I have to emphasize that. And we have a choice, breed or feed for better body condition. What's the timing like, okay? I'm still all right. Okay. Okay, which genotype, just by looking at an animal, which genotype is best for grass conversion efficiency? The improved zebra on the left hand side, which won show prizes in one of the American, top American shows, or the unimproved zebra from Africa you see on the right hand side? There's absolutely no doubt. And I mean, if you think, if you look at those two animals and you think where they come from and what man has done to them, It's a travesty. Which genotype is best for grass finishing? The 9 and 10 package or the 8 and 5 package? I don't think there's any doubt there either. If I were president, I've just written a book, so my ego is a bit high. So <laughs> I, was asked, I was asked in Namibia, in another country in Africa, a couple of years ago, I gave a lecture like this, and they said, but you know, you're telling us all this, but if you were president, what would you do? The country. So this is what I'd do if I was president of this country. The first thing is I'd ban all shows. <laughs> and send Mr. Fluffy Tail to the slaughterhouse and the judge to the jail. That, that'll go a long way to sorting out our problems. The second thing I'd do is I'd ban all current performance testing. All the figures we're using at the moment are totally inappropriate. And that's a, a, a very renowned breed in, in South Africa, a composite breed. Um, we have compulsory performance testing. And that was a result from compulsory performance testing that you see there. Although the bull had a good growth rate and so-called high efficiency of grass conversion or feed conversion, it's an extremely poor animal. Visually, 
is that it doesn't fill his package. And remember, an animal has to go in proportion to its size to be equally efficient. So the fuller the package is, the more efficient that animal is. And that animal doesn't have a full package, so it's an extremely inefficient animal. Yet, on the grounds of actual performance tests, actual growth, a weaning weight, feed conversion efficiency in the feedlot, that was supposedly a good animal. I'd also ban all pedigree recording, because that poor specimen of a bull is a purebred bull with a very long pedigree. If there were no pedigrees, that breed, I'm sure, would never have sold that bull. That poor specimen of a bull was sold to another breeder. So he should also go to jail. I disband all breed associations. Why? Because people have become more important than cattle. Breed associations are more about people than cattle. It's about politics. And it's a big, big problem. Animal scientists to start their careers as herdsmen. As you see there, there's a herdsman. This is what's happening in Zimbabwe today. Um, but again, that's an unimproved breed that lives and dines in the mud. And it's actually served that cow under those conditions. So it's important that we get our feet in the ground. And we have, by doing that, we have a very different perspective to just sitting in an office and behind a desk. And I can speak from experience, because I came from an academic background. And then I, went, I chose to get some cow dung and mud on my feet. And I, I, I instituted a re-education program. I changed survival of the fittest, uh, prettiest rather, to survival of the fittest. All we're doing now is breeding prettier cattle, or cattle that is so-called desirable. But we need to allow nature to do the selection for us, not man. Are the cattle more efficient today than they were 60 years ago? That's a photograph of my late father's herd of cattle in the 1950s. And I, when I look at that photograph, I ask myself the question, what have we done to change those cattle? We've changed them a lot, yes. But what have we done to make them more efficient? And the answer is absolutely nothing. We've done the opposite. We've made cattle less efficient. And why that, that photograph is very important for me as well is in the mid-1950s in our environment, there were no cattle scales. There were no tape measures. There was no supplemental feeding in a very poor nutrition environment. So how did my father and my uncles select cattle visually? Now, which cattle under those circumstances where survival of the fittest was mo more important would they have selected? What would the bulls look like? There would have been those full packages with good body condition, because that determined survival. And that's what they selected. So they were 900% more efficient in their selection just by eye than what we are doing now with figures and EPDs. OK, the best that modern man has done is to breed cattle that are lean and so-called efficient, and that require improved nutrition in order to be productive. That's all we've done. We're just making the feed companies more prof profitable and the veterinary companies. Any questions? Fat has become a dirty word since the 1960s, late 1960s. Feedlot fat or grass fed fat, there's a big difference. White fat or yellow fat. I, I'm sure you're familiar with that. I know in South Africa, because South Africa follows the American model, if you go into a restaurant or you go into a butchery and you ask for meat, they'll make sure that they give you meat that's got white fat in it, not yellow fat. Because the perception is that yellow fat is bad. And that's a perception that's been created by the feedlots. Now, we know that yellow fat from grass Milk from grass has got very high CLAs, anti-cancer agents. So yellow fat is extremely healthy for us. And it's more tasty as well. Fat is essential. 
it's a reflection of gross conversion efficiency. If you have a contemporary group of animals and you are able to judge their body condition, the animal with the best body condition and the fullest package would have converted the grass most efficiently into that product. Because the faster an animal grows in proportionate size, the fatter it becomes and the fuller that package becomes. So it's very easy to visually assess them. Fat is a drought reserve. If you have a long dry season like we have and you have droughts, then fat is essential. Fat, fat meat uh, contains at least twice the amount of energy per pound than lean meat. So if you have a lean cow as opposed to a fat cow and they have to start drawing on body reserves, your lean cow is going to, it won't last very long on her reserves. Your fatter cow will last at least twice as long on the same body reserves. Fat enhances the immune system. Cattle, cows calving in good body condition have higher quality colostrum for the calves and those calves have a higher resistance to disease for the rest of their life. There was a study done in the United States, the feed dot, someone did it, uh, where they looked at uh, the time period that calves were born. All the calves that were born onto uh, imaginary, I imagine green grass or good nutrition, whose mothers had high colostrum, they only had 20% chance of picking up a disease in the feedlot as opposed to other animals that were born in the, in the under drier conditions, poorer body conditions than mothers. So that's, that's another benefit of it. Main determinant of practical fertility. If a cow has good body condition, the chances are she'll reconceive. If she's poor body condition, the chances are very good that she won't reconceive. And of course, carcass quality is also affected by fat. Okay, we, we're talking about performance testing. Man must measure is one of the uh, uh, statements by uh, Jan Bonsma. The problem is we have erred by measuring appropriate criteria inaccurately and inappropriate criteria accurately. What is the most important um, trait required by a cow calf producer for his cattle? Fertility, I imagine. Are there any accurate measurements or EPDs for fertility, for practical fertility? But you have very accurate measurements for feedlot growth. So if you're using EPDs, what the problem then is that the biggest problem with man, I'll come to that now, the biggest problem with man, with cattle breeding, is man deciding what is desirable and what is undesirable. All current selection criteria are based on daily gain, absolute values, daily gain, weaning weight, yielding weight, residual feed intake, that's where they measure so-called feed of conversion efficiency, net feed efficiency, they all result in inefficient cattle. And I'll explain that later, because of fat. More accurate measurement of inappropriate criteria is not very clever. And that's exactly what we're doing with EPDs and the current criteria we're using. Because fat meat contains much more energy than lean meat. It's at least twice as much energy per pound of fat meat as opposed to a pound of lean meat. Now, if, you, if that is the case, think in terms of selection. If you're selecting on growth rate, which animal is inclined to have a faster daily growth rate? The animal that requires more energy per pound of gain, which is fat, or the animal that requires less energy per pound of gain, which is lean meat. Obviously, your lean animals have, will be growing faster because the requirement in terms of energy is less. So if you worked out your efficiency of grass conversion or feed conversion, feed conversion efficiency is due in South Africa, RFI, NFE, the animals that incline not to put on body condition will be advantaged. The animals that put on body condition will be disadvantaged. So what are we doing? Have we all forgotten that cows have to have good body condition to be able to survive and reconceive? And we're doing exactly the opposite by, by, by those measurements. 
The higher energy content of fat meat has confused scientists and nullified the value of all conventional tests. All feed conversion efficiency tests are nullified because of that. Because what you're measuring, the intake is exactly the same, but the output's different. It's like comparing apples and pears. You can't compare the two. You're comparing animals that put some body condition that requires high energy, but it also stores more energy, which is required for survival and for production. To compare to an animal that requires less energy per pound of gain. Any questions? There's time for questions if you'd like to answer. Ask them, I'll try and answer them for you. Yes, sir. Most definitely there is, yes. The question is, is there a way of measuring it accurately as a part uh, from visual appraisal? Is there a way of accurately measuring feed conversion efficiency in your own body condition? Yes, there is a way. I'll get to that. It's a very simple, but it's taking me 40 years to get there. <laughs> I'll get there just now. Any other questions? Yes? Sorry? The only two fat would be a cow that has a hormonal imbalance and doesn't calve regularly. That would be too fat. The only, is there anything that's too fat or is there a um, problem with too fat? I think that's a question. Yes, I said the only problem with too fat is if you have a cow that's inherently has good body condition, but for some reason she hasn't uh, conceived and she doesn't calve regularly. That's the only problem you'd have that I consider to be a problem. Found it true that if the bull has too much fat around the testes, that it's less brutal? The only bulls that I've seen with too much fat around the testes have been feedlot fed. So I don't think it'd be a problem in grass. But the question is a very valid question fat on a bull. And I know there's a relationship between testosterone and fat. So bulls generally are, uh, have, have less body condition than cows. But that doesn't mean you say the package is less full. But there are African breeds that actually put on fat. You can actually see the fat on them. And they're very fragile animals, so it's not a problem. But if, if it's a managed, uh, like in a feedlot, and you have animals that put on body uh, fat around the testes, then it's a problem. But I've never seen it under grazing conditions. I don't think it would be a problem, no. Now, we don't have to worry too much about too fat. We have to worry about too, uh, more about too lean. That is a problem we have. And particularly, most of you are here for grass feeding, grass finishing. That is essential that you have genetically programmed animals that can fatten on, on forage. Okay, fast growing or fast maturing, what, is, what does it require? The bull on the left hand side is fast, absolute growth, but very slow maturing. He's so slow maturing that he's got potential the rest of his life. He'll never achieve his potential. That package will never fill up because he can't eat enough. Even if one of my feed out, he won't get fat. But that bull I took a photograph of was in the AI station here in the United States where they collected semen from that bull for distribution around the world. And I know semen was imported to South Africa from that particular bull. On the right hand side, you have a slow, absolute growth rate, but extremely fast maturing. So we talk about growth, two ways of looking at growth. Absolute growth rate or maturity. Maturity is the way we have to look at it. So the fastest maturing animal, regardless of its growth rate, is the most efficient animal. And talking about fat, you can see that bull on the right hand side is an African zebu. And look at, how, look at its body condition. And that's extremely fertile uh, bull there. Fish and grass conversion equates to fastest maturing, the fattest, and let's not be shy about talking about fat cattle, because it seems to have become a dirty word. A lot of people shy away from the word fat, and the fullest package. That's how we, are, we visually determine. And coming back to your question over here, sir, 
about can we measure the highest 12 month maturity. If we can determine at 12 months of age the bull with the highest maturity rate, that animal, that bull, would be the most efficient grass converting animal. So that poses another question how do you do that? Well, I'll show you this a little bit later. Eight and five package, visually. Look at that animal. I wish I could see more animals like that. Look at that animal. But do you, you, you want to show prize? Extremely poor specimen. He could, he's got potential for the rest of his life. He'll never fill that potential because that package will never fill. And he's got small testers as well because they've selected for large frame, which is indirectly related to late sexual maturity. In fact, I'm going to quote to you what one particular breeder, seed stock breeder, said in 1983 at the height of the frame scoring era. He compared two bulls of his own bulls. He said the problem with this bull, which is a very masculine, short, stocky, thick bull, he said the problem with this bull is he matures sexually too early and stops growing. We want animals that keep on growing. Well, there's one that will keep on growing for the rest of his life. <laughs> Small frame and heavy. That's a composite that I bred for my conditions. A very small frame cow, but extremely heavy. Large frame and light. The common denominator of all efficient cattle is a small or relatively small frame and a full body. And I find it very interesting that you've got animals from very different climates, a temperate climate, virtually an arctic climate, and from a tropical climate. And you take the hump away from the African zebu, the body shape is exactly the same. So all good cattle have a common denominator. The only differences would be related to climatic adaptation and parasite disease resistance. Those are the only differences between cattle from varying environments. But the shape, the frame, the meat to bone ratio, it's all exactly the same. Any questions? Nature is both complex and simple. If we studied it in detail, we'll never be able to understand nature. We'll always be making mistakes. We can either complicate matters or simplify matters. Cattle breeding needs to be simplified. We have to make it very simple. And if, if you leave here with one idea in your mind, and it's just to evaluate visually that full package bull, then I think I've achieved something. Because that is very simple, but it means a lot. The only problem is that we have a, a large group of bulls. And our, me as a bull breeder wanting to sell those bulls, I have to identify them individually in terms of the grass conversion efficiency. But if you go to a group of bulls, you have 50 bulls or 30 bulls that are contemporary bulls, that one package, it's extreme, will just stand out. And that will be an efficient animal that's got the fullest package. We have to read nature correctly. Forget about EPDs. Forget about all this other nonsense. We have to read nature correctly and accelerate the process of natural selection. So what we have to do, we have to devise selection criteria that identify what nature is telling us is the most efficient grass converter, the most uh, fertile cow, and then we have to accelerate that process. That's all, that, that is the, the role that cattle breeders have. Nothing less and nothing more. Now, selecting for grass conversion efficiency, the fullest package, 12 month maturity, and coming back to that question of that gentleman over there, how do we measure that? Well, if you have the 12 month weight of a contemporary group of bulls, you've got 100 bulls, you weigh them at 12 months, you correct the weight for age, and then at 12 months, you go back to what happened many years ago when they selected for frame size, you take a tape measure, you measure hip height, and then from that hip height measurement, you can predict mature size. So at 12 months and even earlier, you can predict an animal's mature size in terms of frame. So you have a 12 month weight, that weight might be uh, 800 pounds. You have a predicted mature size, 
it might be 2,000 pounds, that would make that bull, what, 40% mature. You might have another bull that's got a, a, a weight of 700 pounds, but he's got a mature weight of 1,400 pounds. That makes him 50% mature. So he's a lighter weight, but the package is so much fuller. He's so much more mature. And he is mature, and the package is full because he efficiently converted grass into beef. And how did he do that? Because of a high relative intake. And that is the only uh, determinant of grass conversion efficiency is intake. And there are four factors involved. Frame size, climatic adaptation, parasite disease resistance, and individual appetite. Now that measurement will take all those determinants into consideration. So that is how you do it. Very simple measurement. And what you will find is that that measurement there as a percentage will correlate with what you see by eye. So that bull that you identified that had the fullest package, you will have the highest maturity rate as well. Because the 12 month maturity score measures grass conversion efficiency. It reflects in inherent body condition, reflects overall adaptation. We don't even have to select for that. It's positive to meet the bone ratio, positive to early sexual maturity, because sex hormones limits frame size. It's positive to practical fertility because of better body condition and better hormonal balance. And it's a foundation for all traits. That is the foundation of all cattle breeding, is 12 month maturity. The ideal beef animal is an efficient grass converter. There's a high degree of practical fertility. Optimum milk, about 50% of cow size. High meat to burn ratio and easy care. There is no lowly irritable economically important trait. And that applies to fertility as well. I'm sure that most people in this room, particularly with an academic background, we have all been told that fertility is lowly irritable. Am I right in saying it? Everyone says fertility is lowly irritable. Now the question I ask is, we don't think, how can fertility, which is a survival trait, how can it be lowly irritable? If fertility was lowly irritable, the survival of the fittest would not, would not apply. So fertility is extremely highly irritable. It's a measurement we take to measure fertility that is either highly irritable or lowly irritable. If you're using calving rate, if you've got 100 cows that have got a perfect calving record up to 10 years of age, you've got 100 cows that calve from age of two, they produce nine calves. Are they equally fertile? They've got a perfect calving record, 100 cows. Are they equally fertile? Phenotypically, they're equally fertile. In other words, what you've measured, what you see, they're equally fertile. But if you go back historically, what were the conditions that allowed them to be 100% fertile? Length of your breeding season, the supplementation you gave, decreased breeding season from 90 days to 42 days, take away all supplementation, graze them non-selectively. Will all those 100 cows have a perfect calving record? No, they wouldn't. Because genetics starts playing a role. And what are those genetics? Those genetics are inherent body condition. And is inherent body condition highly irritable or not? It's extremely highly irritable. So if you measure fertility correctly, as I've devised criteria to do that, it's extremely highly irritable. And we can make a very fast progress with fertility as well. But the selection criteria have to be genetically discerning. In other words, I've got criteria that you can use. We have got those 100 cows, and you can categorize them from the most fertile to the least fertile, if you made conditions such that only 10% of the cows had a perfect calving record, you can identify those 10% with 100% of them calving. Okay, the most important selection criteria, 12 month maturity score, cow fertility score, which I don't have time to go into, bull fertility score, 40, 50% cow, cow, calf cow weight, meat to bone, and easy care. Any questions? That's optimum. We don't need more than that. I had cows that produce calves three quarters of their own weight. Too much milk. They require dairy nutrition. And if you start putting on pressure onto them, 
in terms of uh, non-selective grazing, for instance, then those are the first cows that won't reconceive. We don't need more than that, because you only need 60% at, at yearling weight. Did I understand that when they reached maturity, potential maturity, you couldn't grow any taller? Is that what I... That's, that's, that's exactly what happens. It's not overnight, but as an animal reaches sexual maturity, it does that because of a, a, a change in growth hormone to increase in sex hormones, testosterone, and the frame size uh, uh, dro uh, drops. So you have uh, animals that are genetically equally same frame size. One is early maturing sexually, it'll be a lot shorter than the other one that's later maturing sexually. And what you'll see in bulls, again, that foot package, what you also see early sexually maturing bulls, they'll have a very really long body. Looks like they've got a long body. It's because the height relative to length is a different ratio. No, you weigh it, there's a hip height. You weigh him, you got his yearling weight, you measure his hip height. And from the hip height, I've got graphs, and from those graphs, it'll indicate to you what his mature size is. And that comes from the frame scoring era. Missouri frame scores. Missouri frame scores, developed here, which are used incorrectly, but we can use them correctly now. So it's very interesting that, obviously, they looked at frame sizes, hip heights, and that's how they correlated the two. So it's very accurate measurement of an individual's frame size. So 12 months, you can predict, say his frame, uh, his height is, uh, I'm thinking of centimeters, 110 centimeters at 12 months. Go to the graph, 110 centimeters correlates to a frame size of 700 kilograms, 1,400, 1,500 pounds. So it's a relationship between yielding weight and his predicted mature size at 12 months. So at 12 months, you can really predict his uh, maturity and his, more important, his, his, uh, his maturity score, how he relates to his contemporaries. The actual figure doesn't mean anything. It's a relationship between the bulls that means more than anything else. In other words, a ranking. The better, the, the, the higher the better. You see, with these, fra with these figures that I'm talking about, the higher the better. The more fertile the cow, the better. The more mature, the better. It's not like there's other figures where if you go for more, bigger, it becomes negative. These are all positive, and they're all positively correlated as well to fertility, to meat to bone ratio, to adaptation. Competing for grass conversion efficiency, and that is what we, we have to do. And if you can't find the bulls, you've got to breed them yourself. So composite breeding is the quickest. How is it possible for a crossbred cow to be desirable and a crossbred bull to be undesirable? I'm sure a lot of you have heard that statement. You can use crossbred cows, they're very efficient, but stay away from crossbred bulls. Where is the logic in that? Composite breeding, I'm, just, I'm giving these examples of my own cattle because that's all I have at the moment. Um, that's a beef master Mashona first cross bull on the left hand side, and that's a cow that he served, on the right hand side, a cross cow. So it's a cross bit bull and a cross bit cow, and that was the result. So it's extremely effective, but you have to select the right types. There are three very important criteria, and I'll come to that a little bit later, I think it's here. Most important requirements of composite breeding are appropriate breed combinations. And I do see a role for the African Sangha breeds here in the United States. The Sangha breeds I'm referring to are the Mashona that I already have from Zimbabwe and the Turi that also come from Zimbabwe. So they will complement very well with your breeds you have here in terms of uh, for heat adaptation and also for uh, easy care attributes, they polled cattle, and also for a high relative intake. Because they have development conditions where only the survivors of very poor management are what we have today. So appropriate breed combinations, appropriate types within the breeds. You have to go for the full of packages and then appropriate selection afterwards. Selection for maturity rate for fertility. Okay, African breeds are unique. The 
The photograph on the left hand side, my daughter lives in Mozambique and she took that photograph where Charles was swimming cattle across the Zambezi River, which there is crocodile infested and about a mile wide. Those are herdsmen in canoes swimming the cattle across the river. Okay, they've got islands, so they go from island to island to get across the river. But imagine trying to do that, where cattle know there are crocodiles in that river, and yet they're obeying man. It's that relationship between cattle and man that's imprinted in their memories somehow that these African cattle do have. And they live in the real world of dung and mud, and not in motels and air-conditioned apartments. <laughs> Mashona, these are Mashona bulls that are in the United States at the moment, um, and they seem available for those who are interested. I believe that they've got a tremendous potential. What you see there, those banana horns there, are loose horns, they scurs, because most of the cattle are pulled. But some of the bulls develop their skirts because of the, the sex linkage, but just a loose horn. So they will combine very well. A bull like that's got, got a black color, so if you like black, you like polled cattle. I've seen a lot of them around. You can use them. Well, let's be diplomatic. Let's say you can use those cattle to improve these cattle. But you get the same results. But I would believe you're using those cattle to improve the other ones. Tule bulls. Remember, these are extremely good animals. So they are, are animals that don't conform to these uh, conformation requirements that we see here. But these are extremely good, uh, good examples. If you see the bull on the left-hand side, again, we're talking about uh, early sexual maturity. I know that that bull, I've never seen that bull. I've just seen photographs. But I know his early sexual maturity. Because you look at his height, you look to his length. It's very extreme. Mishona cows, these in Florida, extremely good body condition and extremely good heat adaptation from those cows. And they've got a good, remember the African cattle, the other attributes are said about poor management. For centuries they have survived the most difficult conditions that animals can encounter in the tribal situation. Because they corralled for probably about 18 hours to 20 hours a day. They only have four or six hours grazing time. They sleep in the mud and dung. They have to pull carts, they have to pull plows. So all, and they, they're uh, 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 exposed to diseases, parasites. So the animals that have survived over the centuries are the ones that have got the highest relative intake. Otherwise they would never have survived. So they've got this very high intake. We've shown a bull on the left hand side and a young was shown a calf at six months of age here in the United States. The advantage of African Sangha Bostar, they're actually Bostaurus Africanus, so they're very closely related to the, to the European breeds, not so much to the, the zebra breeds. A good inherent body condition, heat adaptation, high meat to bone ratio, good meat quality, easy care, and they're pulled. In your body condition, look at that cow. Heat adaptation. It's a black animal, but with a coat that shiny and glossy because of uh, fat, oil that they exude from their skins, most of the heat is dissipated, is reflected before it even goes into the body. So don't make the mistake of thinking that black animals aren't heat adapted. These animals are extremely heat adapted. And because of the black color, they've got good pigment as well, which in our environment, high altitude tropics where I come from, uh, ultraviolet radiation is very high. So we, if animals that aren't pigmented, they have problems with the eyes, eye cancers, and if they don't have dark hooves, we have a lot of foot rot in, during that wet period. Extremely good temperament and easy care. And they're pulled. There's a young calf that's pulled. But look again at the skin. There are very few cattle in the world that have got those glossy skins, hides. Any questions? Yes. Yes, sir. How do those cattle work at 40 below zero? Well, I think a quarter of them would work very well at 40 below zero, but not 100%. Did I say quarter blood? They come from, uh, these animals come from uh, New Mexico. Where I think it goes about 20 below zero, if I'm correct. The, I see that there's a lot of variation. In the southern United States, I would say 50% blood would be a very good combination. 
further up, maybe a quarter, even an eighth will make a difference. So I think there is, there is value in using him. But obviously the, the cold, the further you go north, the less uh, of that blood you would require in your cattle or need. Yes, did you, somewhere? Have a... Yes. Why would they be docked? Because of the old mindset that brings the DVDs and all the stuff that we go by. I'm kind of asking for do we have to go with a whole new business model, quality cattle, quality cattle? Well, it's easy. Just make me president and I'll sort anything out for you. I'll re educate everyone very quickly. I know, <laughs> make me president and I'll re educate everyone very quickly. <laughs> it is a problem, yes. But from my background, I was also in a situation where I, I sold bulls and I had the highest average price in the country for 16 years, unregistered bulls. So there is a way of marketing them. And there's a big audience, there's a lot of people out there that are becoming aware of what they require. There's a great uh, need for these cattle. So I, I, I think it's just a question of time. And people in the, in the situation as you are now, you're the forefront of it, so make advantage, take advantage of it. Is you know the background the back there on record? Yes. Yes, sir? Um, on the uh, what experience do you have with uh, the quality of the cattle and uh, on the temperament? The temperament is nothing better. They don't have better there's no cattle that have better ten temperament, generally speaking, than these African cattle. Because there's somehow I don't know how genetics works, but the relationship with man, they have a very close relationship with man. They are very good tempered. I was in a, in a, in a two, three days ago, I was in a, amongst a herd of two day cattle, and they came to me, the calves came to me, they started licking me. They have that affinity for man. That photograph in my book, I don't know, I've just written a book, there's a photograph of me there with one of the calves. They have that temperament, they, they have a very close affinity. And I think that's the relationship between man, because man protected them from, from predators as well in the past, in Africa. So the crawl, they were predicted from predators, and they always worked with. So somehow, genetically, there must be a, an imprint in their minds that man, generally speaking, is not a, not a predator. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Don't worry about inbreeding, at all, yeah. not at all. Just worry about breeding, selecting the animals that nature is telling you are the most efficient animals. Yeah, just, keep just keep doing that. So what you're going to do, if inbreeding does take place, it probably does, you increasing the concentration of survival genes. Yeah. That's exactly what you're doing. Yeah. Look at nature. I come from parts in Africa, and I'm sure you have the situation here, we have certain antelope that are very territorial. They've been territorial for millennia, so they must be highly inbred. Yeah. So the, the, the negative attributes have been, uh, don't exist anymore, survival of the fittest. The problem with inbreeding is when man inbreeds, but you can't get away from inbreeding if you're selecting correctly, right. because all your better cattle are in families, so just do that. So it's half brother and half sister is not a problem. I would never use, I wouldn't advise you to use a bull on his daughters or heifers, but if you're breeding, uh, um, structure is correct, you'll only use a bull for a very short period of time and replace him with his sons. So it wouldn't be a problem now. Yes, sir. Well, they've, they've done in the United States, if you can go to, uh, I think it was done at work in Nebraska. They've done it, they're very similar to European breeds. There's not much difference. Even the African zebra doesn't differ much from the European breeds. The African zebra is not a very interesting breed, but it's not available here at the moment. It's very different, it's got small ear. Uh, you cross it with a European breed and you, it won't even have a hump. It'll have a slight crest. It'll have no ear. And there'll be no leather. So you won't know the zebra in it. Can I just, I'll just finish quickly. A couple of, half a minute. 
So I just want to show you some photographs quickly of uh, the composites that I bred, just to show you the type that I'm talking about. Um, again, look at the height length ratio. There's another example. That's a two year old bull, very early maturing sexually. There's another example there. Uh, let's go through quickly. Different colors, but the same type. Very small, others small teats. Pigment. And that particular animal was a treble stocking rate, non-selective grazing, was able to produce that calf, and that calf uh, calved at two years of age, which is unheard of under our conditions. So that's when you get your genetics uh, in tune with your environment. And there's no example there. Thank you.